code and then just escape the rest. And since we only have one hour, then I'll try to be, you know, hurry up. Yeah, this one might go over. So people who are interested in actually looking at more of the code and getting more in depth. Yeah, you I'll upload the Drupal note. Everything. Bit. Sweet. Uh, oh man, Jupyter notebook. Another minute or two, or. Oh yeah, I started the recording already. I thought we were gonna get started. <laughs> Oops. We can start. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Let's just get started. Okay. Uh, well, I guess I'll do this spiel again. I keep it short, just because I think most of you guys have already seen this bit uh, about our club. We're affiliated with this parent organization called Neurotech X. They're a nonprofit that get together a lot of neurotech enthusiasts, research, industry, etc. And they're a global institution. They have major hubs like Neurotech San Francisco and we were the first one in San Diego. And uh, they actually have a lot of resources for student clubs, which is why they're a student club like us. And uh, one of those resources is a yearly competition with a couple thousand dollars as reward. Uh, this year, obviously, it got delayed and uh, we didn't end up competing. But our goal is to compete next year with some really cool headsets and really cool people. So if you're interested in competing and doing EEG project for a competition for some, hopefully, money, then uh, yeah, that's what we're gonna plan on doing. In addition, we have a faculty advisor. His name is Professor Vikas Gilja. He's part of the ECE department and he teaches the grad course in neurosignal processing. He has incredible experience in this field and he actually is very knowledgeable about how to get recruited into this field as well. He was uh, one of the lead recruiters for Neuralink for a year and a half, a couple years ago. And Neuralink is uh, Elon Musk's uh, EEG company. In addition, we are uh, right now sponsored with wearable sensing. Uh, they gave us one of their headsets and this is a research grade dry electrode headset. So uh, we will be using that for our Kaggle, or not Kaggle, our uh, Neurotech competition next year. It's called the DSI-7 if you wanna look up it online. And in addition to that, we should have two or three other headsets to play around with. So there'll be more than just one comp main competition group. So uh, yeah, we'll be having a lot of projects that we'll be planning on hosting for next year. So guys uh, should keep in contact with us and like our Facebook and stuff if you wanna know when that's happening. Uh, okay, hi, um, I'm Zerin and I'm a senior in Cogsign Math. And um, before we get started, I just wanna know like your guys' background. So I think you can answer in the chat. So how much do you know about machine learning algorithms? Oh, I see hands up. So I think like most people got some experience, but not really that much. But then how about like Kaggle competition? Do you guys have an experience in Kaggle? And if you don't know what Kaggle is, uh, I'll just say it just so you don't have to ask. It's kind of like, if you ever heard of like Leap Code or something like that, it's kind of like a data science hub instead for, mm -hmm. uh, and they have a lot of data sets with competitions. And what people do is they download the data set, they run some algorithms on it, and then they return the results data set. And then you get placed on a leaderboard depending on how well you did and how well your, uh, your algorithms worked. Interesting. So it's kind of like a friendly data science competition website. Yeah, Anything it's really cool because you can, yeah, money. <laughs> Important points. Okay, go to next slide then. So this is a line of our presentation. So first we will introduce like how you do signal is kind of different from other like normal data type and also introduce some machine learning algorithm for each signals and also one deep learning method. Essentially it's a convolution neural network and then a Kaggle project done by Colin. So I will mostly talk about the first two, three points. And Colin will talk about his project. Go to next slide, please. So um, generally people will use machine learning algorithm as a method to learn a feature of data 
uh, make prediction or decision on data. So basically there's clustering, prediction, uh, and also classification. And especially for EG signals, machine learning uh, has been widely used as feature extraction method. And EG signal are often like uh, vectors of channels, channels numbers by time points. And normally time points um, has a, like is much larger than the channel number. So it's um, usually high dimensional. Um, different than other data type, um, EG signals has high dependency between um, data points, um, both spatially and temporally. So we need to treat them like kind of differently uh, by doing more feature engineering. Go to next slide, please. Um, and usually in any machine learning um, practice, we need to do cross validation for more for both like model selection or, and also to evaluate how good our model works. And the procedure of cross validation is often, let's say, assign the, the features into groups and choose one groups at once um, and treat that group as validation and the rest groups as a training set and repeat this procedure for like K times and K depends on like uh, how many groups you have um, grouped the data into and using each fold as a testing set for once and you calculate average loss for the whole procedure and you can use that average loss to compare the model to choose the best model parameters and also um, to evaluate your uh, model. So we should always do cross validation to avoid overfitting and as you can see in the um, corner graph, um, when you try to like train your model for like many iterations, the training error always goes down. However, the testing error may like goes up. We want to stop the training before the testing error goes up, even though the training is going down because like the testing error is the thing we really care about. So um, that's basically why we, we would always do cross validation. Um, go to next slide, please. And another uh, measure in machine learning, um, like we will use is the ROC and AUC curve. The ROC curve is the um, is called the receiver operating characteristic curve. Okay, I never say that long word. I, I always use ROC. And uh, this is a curve that measures a model performance performance on the false positive rate and the false negative rate, which is uh, within the scope of classification problem. So you can see the curve on the x-axis is the false positive rate and the y-axis is like the true positive rate. So um, on this RC curve, um, if we go to the red upper, uh, upper red corner and set like that point as our model, then we would have no false negative. And on the other hand, if we go to the uh, left, like um, downward co uh, kernel um, corner, then there will be no false positive. And a good choice will in like in between, like the, in the middle of the curve, where like we have both low false positive and false negative. And you see the area on the curve measures like the area under the ROC curve. And basically the larger the, the area, the better the model because you can make the upper left corner um, approaching the to one. So you would have both like low false positive and low negative. And yeah, that's it. And then I will introduce several machine learning methods that will be used uh, in Collins Kegel project. And uh, in, his, in his project, he basically have a classification problem. So this method uh, all used by him as a classification method uh, algorithm. So the first one is support vector machine. Mm. 
so in this method, um, we always use the, like, uh, there are four kernels. Do you guys know what, what a kernel mean? Mm, okay. Um, so basically we, uh, kernel, kernel cheek just means like we mapped our data into different dimensions. Say we, originally we have a, um, you know, data in a normal space and then we can map that into a radical space or like any other space so that uh, we can differentiate uh, differentiate data into different group more easily. And for SVM, it's a supervised machine learning method uh, that, uh, that both can be used in classification error regression analysis. And um, so up, after we have, uh, we do the kernel trick, the SVM would um, separate data points in a linear way in that kernel space and then like map them into different uh, groups. And the way that support vector machine is like doing well compared to other methods is that it has a boundary, um, boundary on the separating uh, line so that it can be like, it will perform better in the testing set. Can, um, okay. And the second method is the logistic regression. Um, it's mostly used uh, in classification and uh, especially in uh, like two, uh, in classification only with two labels. And uh, the logit function represents the probability of a data, uh, like given a data point, like the data belong to one group other, uh, other than the other group. And it's pretty simple and straightforward. It just like do a log function over a linear function. So that's essentially similar to the linear regression, both in like how you calculate the, the beta zero and beta one parameters. So, mm. Go to next step. And the third method is the random forest. And random forest is a method like also mostly used in classification problem, maybe also regression kind of. Mm. And so the reason why we would prefer like prefer random forest than distant tree is like in random forest, um, we are less likely to overfit the data because uh, we have multiple trees and um, so that will bring us less variance and reduce the chance of like um, doing the uh, classified data points into like into what I would want to perform well in the testing scene. Go to next slide, please. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's all about the algorithm. And now we want to take a look at what and how do we do a actual com Kaggle competition uh, on BCI, Brain Computer Interface. And uh, this is the project I have done for Cox 99 uh, last year. So if you want to check, you can, you can uh, go to my GitHub and, and, and see the code. <clears throat> but, here, but today I will also go through some of them. <clears throat> so uh, let's, go, let's talk about what this, what this Kaggle condition actually is. So uh, as you, you can imagine that there are lots of things we can do for BCI, but there's one particular model called P300 Speller that is very fascinating and uh, used a lot within BCI uh, field. So a, a P3 hand speller is basically a interface that you can spell letter uh, come out of your brain without using pencil and pen, without using your mouth, without, without using your hand. And it's pretty powerful. 
Um, so uh, in this chemical condition, we don't want to uh, re, re, uh, we don't want to model the PS and best dollar. We don't want to repeat this process. We just want to uh, learn when the PS and dollar make mistake. And uh, sorry, sorry about my email. They go away. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's the goal of this. So we are actually doing meta learning on PS and dollar rather than performing uh, classification on ladder. So uh, the goal of this challenge is whether is to evaluate whether the item selection, aka select a correct uh, letter or not. Uh, did we do this process correct or not through the, the feedback of, from the EGCAP? The decision, this decision could be used further to improve the BCI performance because once we have learned uh, when we can make mistake, then we can use this strategy to further improve the performance of our BCI. And that's the whole point of this, our, this project. So we want to do matter learning and uh, to, uh, to correct our BCI performance. Uh, so let's, let me introduce the data. Actually, the data is kind of complex because there are lots of, uh, there's subject, there's a uh, session per subject. There's also channel and uh, so far so, so on. So let me just like uh, go through this quickly and let's go through uh, the Kaggle Competition Drupal Notebook. As you can see, this picture is just a standard piece of hand builder. So you, when you see the blinking and you just want to attend a specific, a specific letter, then the, the P3 speller can tell which letter you are attending. And that's the goal of P3 speller. But we want to uh, classify whether we, we make the correct mistake or not. So um, our data has 200, uh, our data has 26 subjects, 16 for training and 10 for testing. And uh, the P3 is on a 2800 hertz. So each subject participated in five different sessions. And uh, the first four session, for the first four sessions, each session has 60 target stim stimulus. And the last one, which is the fifth one, has 100 target st stimulus. That means for each subject, we have 340 target st stimulus. And uh, our, uh, our Kaggle condition is a binary classification problem. So zero means bad feedback, and one means good feedback. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so we can take a look at the uh, Drupal notebook. So we set up our uh, Drupal notebook by installing lots of stuff. And uh, we next next step is just pre-process our data, right? Our data is not clean. It's not pre-processed. It's, it's going to be a loss of uh, EGD, long EG signal. So the, re the reason why we want to uh, do pre-processing is because first we want to, the, the, the way we want to do it is first, we want to abac and clean the data. The second, second one is after we abac and clean, we want to get the feature from the abac data. So what is abacing? Well, abacing is just find the stimulus, stimulus in time intervals. So let's take a look at this uh, figure. And uh, we know that some there are some uh, time points we have this spike right. The spike is when we attend a, a single letter, and uh, the piece we handle spiller use this spike to classify into a letter. Uh, so we want to build a interval around this time this spike, so that we have a baseline. We have a ERP which is our uh, the, the area of interest, and uh, we have a loss of noise data. And uh, in this type of condition, my interval is from zero to 700 relative to the st stimulus start time. And uh, uh, so after, after we find this interval, we want to, we want to apply the filter because we, there, you can imagine there, our EG signal has lots, lots of noise. So we're doing uh, signal processing. Um, so, so the goal of Appkin is, is first help us clean the data, second remove the EG data error that is not necessary. And uh, we have a 0.7 second interval for each uh, st stimulus. 
and uh, we also apply baseline correction with signal from 0 to 100 as the baseline. So as you can see that uh, at this interval, that there's not much stuff going on. So we can use this baseline interval to uh, compute the magnitude of this noise and sub subtract everything, uh, our, subtract uh, this noise from our EG data. Um, that's the goal of Appkin. So once we have this, uh, once we have done Appkin, we have lots of uh, generated data and the data dimension is kind of complex, but we can go through over here. So um, our data, so for each subject, we have 340 trials. And for each trial, there are 56 channels. So channels means uh, there are 64 channels on our uh, headset to collect our data, to collect data. And uh, it turns out that if we use 200 Hertz and uh, uh, 700 milliseconds, we end, up, we end up with 140 time points. And so our zero means that we don't know how many, uh, how many data we have right now, but this is only a placeholder for our data. So uh, this is the correct dimension for our training data. This is the correct dimension for our test data, but just the first number will be different. So let's go to next slide, which is feature extraction. Um, the feature extraction is a big part for CAD computation because you are uh, reducing, you are actually eliminating a lot, lot of noise, right? And, and some machine learning problems are very sensitive to this noise. So the first algorithm we want to use is called x down covariance algorithm. This algorithm applies a special spatial filter, a uh, lot of, uh, we can, you can specify the filter number, but it applies spatial filtering to our data so that su such that it increases the, the signal to noise ratio. And by doing so, we significantly reduce the dimension of our facial vector. So, uh, so as you, uh, it's called x down covariance algorithm because it extracts the covariance matrix from our data as the feature we want to learn. Uh, so after this transformation, we our data is already from as you can recall, it's from 556, which is the channel number, by 140, uh, which is the time point we have. And this will be reduced to 20 by 20. So 20 by 20 is our is the damage of our covariance matrix. And the 340, uh, 340 you, you might recall, is the trial per subject. And n is the number of subjects we have. So when n is 16, we are doing, uh, we are working on tra training data. And when n is 10, we are working on testing data. And the algorithm is just very similar to how you so piece has, okay, yeah. Can you explain? Okay, and uh, Joe, Jillian already handled this. Thank you so much. So um, we have a Z, which is the mean subtract, subtracted data. And we want to uh, uh, compute the covariance matrix using the mean, subtract, mean subtracted data. And uh, the algorithm is kind of, th there's lots, lots of linear algebra and geometry uh, involved, but I'm not going to go through this, but you just, I just want to get, let you guys know that this actually re uh, help our, help our algorithm to perform better by increase our signal to noise ratio. And uh, so after this, we have a, for each data point, so we have, 340 by n data, uh, data point. For each data point, we want to further, we, we have a covariance matrix, right? And we want to uh, apply some algorithms so, such that we want to reduce this uh, co uh, covariance matrix further that to something that has less feature and uh, also be capable, uh, and also uh, we can phase those data into a standard machine learning algorithm. So, and this algorithm is called tangent space algorithm. Um, so what we are doing is that we use, we apply this algorithm on the covariance matrix and, and by projecting the, uh, the covariance matrix from, from Euclidean space to something called Riemannian space. And uh, meanwhile, we are trying to minimize the distance to the Riemann mean. Uh, so uh, 
the algorithm might sound complex, but at the end of the day, we are transforming our data from a dimension of 20 by 20 to something that has a 20, 210 feature. So as you can see that we are transforming a, a from a three-dimensional NumPy array to a two-dimensional NumPy array. And the first dimension is the number of data points. So that, that means we can directly fit this data into a machine learning algorithm. However, there's one thing that I want to point out is that deep learning is different from standard machine learning because uh, deep learning is, uh, so, so for example, we want, if we want to class, classify images, then the image has not only has uh, RGB, it also has the height and the width. So it has, uh, for, so for each image, it has three dimensions. And that actually corresponds to our uh, unextracted feature data. So if you recall, uh, if you recall from the Jupyter notebook, our data is like this. So is this, uh, with that in mind, we can apply deep learning, which is, uh, in this case, it's called CNN, convolution neural network to this data. And uh, we will talk about that later. Okay, let's continue to see the next step, which is um, so after extraction, we can directly fit this data into our classification algorithms. And uh, so we already talked about SVM logic regression and random forest, so I won't talk about those here. But I want to, uh, so she also, she also talked about cross-validation. And uh, so the configuration here for this project is, I, I used to leave four subjects out cross-validation on 16 subjects, because that makes perfect sense. 16 is divisible, divisible by four. Um, so we also want to use grid search to find the best combination of hyperparameters. I should, this should be hyperparameters. Uh, after training, we, we want to test on the data, on the testing, we want to test on the testing data on, for the 10 subjects. And uh, the metric for our model is AUC, which so we also talk about, uh, it stands for area under our, area under our seeker. Um, so the first strategy to to uh, drastically increase the score is just is first is uh, predict the probability instead of the categorical labels. So what I mean is that we don't want to classify each data into a zero, either zero or one. We want to classify them into a probability from zero to one, and those are in real number. Uh, the second way to do this, is, the second way to improve this score is transform the categorical labels into a soft labels using ElastNet. But uh, this will, you need to actually have another model to, uh, to add on this, uh, your machine learning algorithm. So I, rather than using this, I use the first strategy just by predicting the probability. Um, so the, the predicted probabilities will be uploaded to Kaggle, Kaggle uh, website for scoring. And the, 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 one, the last thing I want to talk about for this slide is, on this slide is EGNet. So as I mentioned before, like we can use deep learning to do a EGNet, EG data classification. And uh, uh, so how do we do this? Well, as I mentioned before, like we can treat the uh, original epoch EG data as a a multi-dimensional data, and we can fit this multi-dimensional data into a convolutional neural network. So, uh, so the reason why the first dimension is so large is because this is equal to the number of uh, subjects times the, the number of trial per subject, which is 16 times 340, which is 5440. Uh, 5, uh, we have one here. The dimension is one, so we are adding one more dimension in between. This is because we want to use a 2D convolutional neural network. And a 2D convolutional neural network has a specific dimension called channel. And as you can imagine, like uh, a, a, an image has a three channel, which is RGB, but here we only have one. So we only do this for CN classification. And the configuration for this EGNet is a uh, 56 channel, uh, the channel number is 56, the sample number is 140, 
So, and we also use dropout. Uh, the kernel length is 100, and uh, there are some hyperparameters hyper corresponding to the uh, configuration for depth, uh, deep wise convolutional layer and uh, separable convolutional layer. If you want to learn more about this, uh, you can read the paper. I link this. I link the paper at the end of the slide. And uh, uh, for train to train a CN neural network, we want to minimize the loss. And the loss we are using is called sparse categorical cross cross entropy. And uh, we want to use Adam to to optimize. Uh, and uh, our match metric is accuracy. So as you may, as you recall that our final metric is, is actually AUC. We want to compare the score on AUC, but here we want to classify in accuracy is because uh, it's, it's because AOC is not used to do back back propagation. The best parameters were saved using checkpoint for pred prediction, and uh, uh, we just want to use the best parameters to um, predict our our training data on our training data. Another thing I will illustrate is is that we want to weight our loss because our label our data is unbalanced. So uh, there are only one out of seven, actually no, three out of ten, uh, seven out wait, three out of ten, three out of ten is uh, labeled as one, and uh, seven out of ten labeled as zero. So we we want to balance this label, and uh, we also want to. So our batch size is thirty two, which is the magic number. Everybody use thirty two as batch size. And uh, our epoch number is 100. So this epoch is different from the epoch we have talked about before. So this epoch is only for uh, uh, how many times we want to repeat training our neural network. This is completely different from our epoch in, uh, we talk about for EG, for EG uh, data pre-processing. Okay, so this is our related works. Um, the first three are the data feature extraction algorithms. You can check those papers. And if you want to know, learn more about deep learning, um, you can check this paper called EGNet, which I already talked about before. Um, this is pretty cool. So um, let's go to the actual Drupal notebook and see how do we code this Kaggle competition. So I already went through the introduction and uh, just keep in mind that uh, our data has 20, is in 200 hertz, and there are 26 subjects, 10 for 16 for training, 10 for testing. And each subject participated in five different sessions. Each session is a trial. So I will use these two words interchangeably. Um, you can download this calculator competition uh, with the link I uh, Jilin sent in the chat. So we set up our Drupal notebook by in, in, installing a lot of packages. So I use PRY Ramen for uh, feature extraction. So I also download this EG models. Also you need to install TensorFlow. And uh, also I will I, I have tried something called StackNet. And uh, for to, to run this, you you should install PY StackNet and also LightGBM and, and XGBoost. And we will mostly use those four packages throughout our Drupal notebook. Um, so this our import our uh, models, uh, actually packages. Then the second part is pre-processing, as I discussed, as I mentioned before. So the pre-processing are separate, are first epoching, then feature extraction. But but for for uh, but in order to epoch, we have to design a button pass filter, right? We have to filter out the the noise data. So we our our filter is is called Butterworth. It's a non causal fil uh, filter, and uh, um, the frequency is two hundred hertz uh, because our data is sampled at two hundred hertz. Our low cut means that we will discard any signal, any EG data below zero point one hertz, and we will discard any EG signal above four hundred uh, forty hertz. And we wrote this butter, butter, uh, bandpass filter using SciPy. Um, so this already, so this butter is came from SciPy. 
And this also com comes from Cypress. So we just write, write a small function to for this butter but the butter and pass filter. Uh, we also also have this figure which I already talked about before. So we want to apply a, an interval around the signal that we are interested in. The epoch start time is zero relative to the um, stimulus, and the end time is seven hundred. Our baseline correction start time is also zero, but the end time is one hundred. So it's it's way before when the actual P three hundred happens. So by the way, it's the reason why it's called P three hundred is because uh, after the, after each stimuli, there's a spike, a positive spike around the three hundred milliseconds. That's why it's called P three hundred. And using those uh, configuration configurations, we can compute the number of mark per epoch. Uh, so this is the epoch length. Uh, the length is the dimension of our uh, time points, right? And uh, so that's that's about that. And uh, here we try to understand what actually our data look like, look like because in the slide it's actually very hard to understand uh, if we, we don't actually code those. <clears throat> so uh, those configurations I already talked about. And here are the 56 channels. So from FZ1 to OZ2. We import pandas and read the CSV. And this is the training labels. So we can see the training labels are, so there's a feedback ID. And for each feedback ID, we have a corresponding prediction. So this is, the prediction is actually what we are, we, what we want to predict into. And let's look at the sample training data first. So this is only one trial. Imagine that, uh, 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 remember that we have 30, 340 trial, trials per subject, and then we have 16 subjects for training, 10 subjects for testing. And uh, for each trial, we have time. So it's, it's from, it starts from zero uh, all the way to 660. Uh, this is in millisecond. And uh, we have lots of channels. And uh, we also have feedback event. And this is important because this tells us whether a, speci a specific time point is actually a feedback or not. And we, if the feedback event is one, then we correspond this to, we, we map this to uh, a label over here. So uh, we want to, so it, it, this, these are the two separate tables. Uh, the next thing you want to do is create a placeholder for loading our data. Because we want to uh, load our, uh, we want to upload our data, we want to figure out the dimension and, and I already talked about the dimension and this is, should be, so this is the dimension for per, per data point. Okay, so next step is to define our effort function. And uh, there's a lot of going, lots of things going on. Uh, this is a giant function, but all it does is, is to generate one epoch per trial. So um, the first parameter is called um, file path, is where our CSV file located. And the second one is channel, which is just a, a array of string, and uh, it's exactly this. The third one is the frequency, which is a 200 hertz. And the each filter is a function that we wrote before. So th it's this butter band pass filter. We pass this function into this function. And uh, we also had this stimulus times. We uh, I will not talk about talk about this. Is this not re relevant to our project? Um, we have baseline. So if baseline is true, then we do baseline correction. If it's not true, then we don't do. And uh, as I mentioned before, I have epoch start, epoch end time, baseline start, baseline end time. Uh, those are all in milliseconds. <clears throat> and the next thing is just basically go through those epoch function. So um, the first is load, load data, and uh, we uh, want to uh, create an interval and number array that puts the interval data. So as you can see, there are lots of data 
from 0 to 700 and uh, put the, that data into a NumPy array. Then after that, we apply e, uh, EEG filter to our raw EEG per channel. And uh, after that, we want to stack all of those uh, data into a giant NumPy array. So the final, the final epoch will be a giant, uh, it will be a 3D NumPy array, right? Because as you can see, these are three dimension. Okay, and uh, this is the function of epoch. Next, we want after epoching, oh, this is actually uh, the code, the process of epoching data. So uh, giving a, a file, a CSV, we want to uh, epoch each CSV file into a, a 4D, a 3D NumPy array, and we want to concatenate those uh, 3D NumPy array into a 4D NumPy array. So 16 training subjects, and for each, sub for each training subject, we have 340 trials. And uh, for, for each, so this defines the number of data points we have. And for each data point, we have 56 channels and uh, 140 time points. And this is a figure. These are four figures for our um, Apple data. So uh, the first one is we are only uh, looking at the FZ channel. And uh, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of stimulus, right? So this, each line is a, is a single stimuli. And uh, we can, and we have um, 60 stimuli, stimulus for this graph. By averaging them, we can see that there is a common pattern that there is this huge spike right after 300 uh, milliseconds. So we're doing this correctly. And uh, the next step is after we add our data, right? We have a, this a four dimensional data and uh, we want to reduce the dimension. So as I talked about, we, we apply X down covariance and tangent space. This is actually pretty easy because we have this PY, PY Ryman package and we can just import those two packages from uh, these two functions from the package. Um, we want to load the training label, the label for training data, <coughs> which was Y train. And uh, I draw this because I don't want to do it multiple times. Um, so uh, we construct our transformer. Here we specify the configuration. And next we just want to collapse the first two dimension because uh, this two dimension defines the number of data points we have. So we reshape this uh, and uh, we transform just by calling fit and transform. So we fit on the train data and transform the train data. And next, we will want to create a, uh, so this is X down and then tangent space. Remember, we want to do this in sequential order. So uh, X down covariance algorithm, fit transform, then tangent space, tra tangent space uh, fit transform on the training data. And for the testing data, we don't want to fit because uh, this, this is what, what we do. We don't want to fit on the training data, and on the testing data, sorry. And so we just want to transform the testing data. And then, and after that, we end up with three pre-processed, uh, two, two, pre -pre two processed data, which is called X-Train and X-Test. So both of those have dimension of, uh, so the first one has, uh, 5,440 data point, and each data point has 210 uh, feature. So this is a just a standard uh, data for machine learning, for standard machine learning algorithm, right? And uh, we can just apply, fit those into a machine learning algorithm. So how do we do this? Um, well, we just import packages from sklearn. And uh, here, I just I just did uh, random forest because all of, the, all of them are very similar. And uh, so we import a random forest classifier. We also import research uh, cross validation. Uh, so this is just find the best combination of of hyper parameters we we have. So um, we construct a random forest classifier, 
we also construct a grid search call fire, a grid search CV object by passing this random forest ob object inside as a base estimator, pass all the hyperparameter, and uh, we want to do fourfold cross validation. This means we want to use all our all of our CPU sources. Okay, so next is just fit on the train data, right? So X train, Y train, our data and our label. And our fit, we, we dump the object because uh, uh, I don't want to train over and over again the same thing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, we, when we print out the best parameters, we can see that uh, the, the bootstrap is true. Uh, this actually can unnecessary, but the best max depth is 80. The max fit, the best ma max feature is three and the best n estimator is 200. So it searches for the best combination. And then here we, ha we have. So after this step, we want to evaluate the performance on the, of, of the random forest. So how do we do this? Well, as we mentioned before, we, have, we want to use ROC curve, right? ROC, uh, ROC curve, and uh, we want to use AUC score as a metric. Um, so <clears throat> as I mentioned before, like to hack the AOC score, we want to predict the probability instead of the hard label. So you can just call predict uh, underscore prob, which predicts the probability. And uh, there we have it, it's very simple. Then we want to test, uh, compute the metric, the AOC metric on the testing label. So I already have the um, true label, but you should never touch this true label when you train your model. And uh, we only use this uh, testing label only for uh, scoring our random forest classifier. So now we have uh, this score and we want to see how it performs and see this red line is the average case. So you, this is like random, the worst chance is just doing this randomly, right? You randomly draw a zero or one. But here, this is our classifier performance. We actually have a 73, a 0.73 area, which is quite good. Um, so next step is, uh, actually, I, I won't talk about this more. So uh, even though 73 does not sound very, um, very fascinating, but it's still, for this Kaggle, you can imagine that there's lots of noise in our EG data. And 73% is, is actually very good. That means our classifier actually learned something from our data rather than just doing randomly. It's much better than random. Okay, so <clears throat> the one last thing I want to do is, is talk about this uh, StackNet, which I, I find very interesting on Kaggle because it's a, it's, I would say this is a model that is widely used for Kaggle competition because it, it's a, it's very very powerful. Um, it, I don't. I do not recommend this. You use this for research purpose because it's it's kind of just um, brute force search. So um, a stack net is is one type of ensemble learning. So if you are familiar with ensemble learning, you know that there's boosting, there's bagging, and there's also stacking. And the stack net is the stacking. So uh, we. So we stack a lot of, a lot of uh, models in the first layer. And then we want to learn how to combine those uh, classifiers into a single score and single model. The, 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 uh, the way StackNet is doing that is using a blender. So it blends and this is a meta, meta learner. So it learns how to combine those learn, uh, this, uh, classifiers into a single one. And uh, we can also stack vertically, um, uh, horizontally. So, <clears throat> so after this, we uh, fade into a second layer. And second layer also can be a, a stack of multiple um, machine learning algorithms. And then we, just, we can keep stacking those uh, until we find a, a correct com combination on which one you like, which way you like. It's, it's kind of, it's like, it's very much like magic because you don't know which combination will work better, but the standard way is 
you want to combine linear model and flexible model together so that your, your stacking will be pretty comprehensive. And in the end, it will only out, uh, output a single, a single um, a binary classification. But here, we also want to use pretty probability. So you can see that we have lots of uh, models implement, uh, imported. And those are the corresponding models here. And we define our models by doing this. So it's a array of, array of um, models. And the model we are using is it's grid search. So we, we, we can also apply grid search for each uh, classifier to find the best, the best combination and then use that combination to as a single classifier. Okay, so this is StackNet and uh, we use four full cross validation as we mentioned before. We split the data and the fit into this StackNet. Our metric is AOC, so it selects the best combination using AOC metric. The false is already generated, so we just pass in. Restacking is false. Uh, I don't, this, this is some uh, meta, this is hyperparameter you want to tune. You don't want to, you don't know which works better beforehand. Um, same thing goes for use retraining. But the, use, the, but the use proba is true because we want to predict the probability rather than a hard label. And job is one. And uh, so uh, the next step is just to make prediction. So we fit our stagnant on the training, model, training data set as the same thing as the random forest. And next we want to predict the, the probability. So so after we, after, after, uh, we predict we have this uh, Y probability, right? Our, we predict our uh, label. So we can, we can, we can compare the, our predicted label with the true label using AOC score. And uh, here, we, our AOC score is 76, uh, 76%, which is slightly, slightly better than uh, random forest. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit better, but it's not significantly better, but, um, since it's better, then it might just move you ahead of uh, several places on Kaggle. So this is actually a, a thing that people do uh, as a com competitioner a lot. So just try to uh, hack the data, uh, hack the label, hack the score as, as high as possible. And uh, that's all I have today. So I did not include the deep learning, but uh, if you want to check it out, you can go to my GitHub, and uh, I already have uh, the code included as as a py dot py file. So uh, that's all about today. So if you have questions, you can leave in the chat. Thank you. I know that was a lot, guys. So if you have any questions, immediate questions, you can also ask them right now, and we'll be hanging around for another thirty minutes. And for those of you that uh, don't have any questions or have to go, then uh, thank you for coming.